Uh, but now, I, we, now we get to open the Bible, which we're really glad for, right? You're really glad for that? Here we are. It's hard to believe, but we're already in the 18th chapter of Matthew's gospel, right? I mean, it's like, how did we get all the way to chapter 18 uh, so quickly? It's going so fast. It's only been 53 weeks, and here we are already in Matthew 18. And uh, some of you, some of you are like, wait, it's taking you 53 weeks? Like, we're not in a hurry. We want to digest the word of God w- and, and take it all in. And so here we are, uh, Matthew 18. And, um, and just a quick little note here is, uh, so you can open your Bibles, Matthew 18. And what we find here uh, is, that, is that Matthew, as he's constructed this gospel under the, under the inspiration of the Spirit, he, he, we're taking another turn here because as you've, as you've noticed, we've pointed out, there's these blocked sections in Matthew's gospel where, where for a while he'll tell the story, the narrative of Jesus' life and ministry. And then he'll turn a corner and then he'll go into discourse, a discourse section where he's giving us the teachings of Jesus, what Jesus taught his disciples and the crowds. And so this morning we're, we're going from narrative to discourse. We're going from the story to now the teaching as, uh, as Matthew 18 opens up. And here's something cool. Uh, to to uh, work through this text uh, together with me this morning is Brandon Hart, and he is the newest member of our preaching team. So I'm going to invite Brandon to come up here. And uh, yeah, you can give him a round of applause. A good welcome. And um, so, so let me just tell you, he's going to introduce himself a little bit, but I want to just get you acclimated here. So Brandon, um, Brandon's joining our preaching team as a volunteer, but not as a layman. He's actually an ordained minister and has served in pastoral ministry for a number of years. He and his family have been a part of City Point Church since the fall of 2019, and we're just super glad. I'm really glad to be your friend and to be your pastor and to be your, a gospel partner with you and to, to share this text. We've got our hands full this morning. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. It's like, oh, wow. <laughs> when we read it, Brandon's going to read it in a minute, and we're all going to go, oh, wow, we better sit up straight here this morning. So anyway, Brandon, yeah. uh, introduce yeah. yourself. So excited to be here, and again, thank you for uh, the opportunity and privilege to share in the gospel and the message and the preaching of, of the Lord's Word, and really that's what it's about here today. And my family, we've, I mean, we are part of the City Point family, and this is, this is the church that we are, we love it. Actually, my wife is in the, she's the, Cassie Hart is the new uh, kids ministry lead, mm-hmm. and enjoying that. My son, Elijah, you may know him, he actually beat me to the stage. So here before me. Um, and then I, I have a daughter named Sophie, a little older than Elijah, and uh, she, she gets me. That is my little girl, apple of my eye there. And so I, I, my family is thrilled uh, to be a part of everything that we are doing. And I'm excited. Really, we're partnering in the gospel and really the idea of the Christian life. What we do at City Point is that we live the gospel with those in the family and bring the gospel to those outside the family of God. And that's how we grow the family. Yep. That's what yep. we're doing. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's our language, and I think that's, gr- mm-hmm. I think that's great. And uh, so this morning, like I said, Brandon's going to read the text in a minute, but I want to get us, uh, let's get our minds wrapped around this, because it's no surprise that there's a, there's a link, a connection between last week's text and this week's text. So if you remember, last week was about um, this, this narrative story about how Jesus, though he was not obligated to pay the temple tax for the sake of not offending those that he was striving to bring the gospel to, he paid the tax. So he paid a tax he wasn't obligated to pay because he didn't want to trip anybody up as he was trying to bring the gospel to them. And so we talked about our responsibility as followers of Christ to be sure that those to whom we're trying to bring the gospel to, mm-hmm. as Brandon said, yeah. we're, we are um, conducting ourselves in such a way that we're not hindering that. Well, this week, we're, we're, this week, the focus is on those who are inside the family of God. And what's interesting is same sort of language is used. So, um, so the connection is this, there's this, um, in our English translations, it doesn't make it super easy to, to notice. But as you, as you study it, if you get into the original language, which was written in Greek, there's this reoccurring Greek word that's translated mm-hmm. because of nuance. It's translated a little bit different in English. 
Um, but it's the Greek word scandalizo. Uh, in noun form, it's scandalon, and which, of course, we could easily understand that that's where we get our English word of scandal. It means to trip somebody up. That's what it means. It, it is a scandal to trip somebody up. Last week, it's a scandal to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in somebody's way so that they can't get readily to the gospel or we can't get the gospel to them. This week, similarly, we're saying the same, it, the text is saying the same thing. It's scandalous to, and the translations this week are, um, so we saw that in verse 27 last week, it's translated offended. This week in, in verses 6, 7, and 8, it's translated either to cause somebody to sin or to, or to tempt them to sin or to cause them kind of to, uh, uh, to, um, uh, to sin against their own faith, right? So it's a scandal to... Um, it's a scandal to hinder somebody in that way. So that's, that's part of the context of, of as we get into Matthew chapter 18. So, so Brandon, yep. if you would read the text and, um, and, and, and we'll follow along. Yep. All right. So Matthew 18, starting at verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin... It would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world for temptations to sin. For it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Yeah, that sounds pretty serious, right? It's one of those things where, um, where when, you just, when you teach and preach through the Bible, uh, book by book, chapter by chapter, line by line, you don't get a, you don't get a skip over <laughs> passages no. like this. We've got to handle them, right? And so, uh, and so let's, let's pray and ask God to help us to... to to take this in. Mm -hmm. Father, we are grateful to, to come together today. I, I pray first for those who are with us that aren't yet followers of Christ. Uh, thank you, God, that you, that you love them, that you are um, fully committed uh, to their well-being, and um, both here in this life and, and, and eternally. And I pray that you would work in them this day to help them to see the truth of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray for those who are followers of Christ, Lord, that you will uh, I, we're, we're eager, Lord, for those passages that instantly warm our hearts and encourage us. And, and, and then there's these other ones, Lord, that, that are um, much more sobering. And I pray that, um, that we would be attentive, Lord, for these, uh, this is your word. And so uh, teach us today, guide us today, and, um, and ultimately, Lord, we want to honor you in all ways. And so we commit this to you. Help Brandon and I as we communicate and declare this truth. Amen. Amen. So uh, Brandon's going to take this first section, really verses one through four, is, and so we're talking about living the gospel with those inside the family, and kind of the warning is don't make assumptions, Yeah. right? So take it away, Brandon. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, again, uh, so glad to be here this morning, uh, worshiping with you and also uh, bringing the word. And so let's, let's jump into it. Right there at verse one, we find this verse. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So we got the disciples bringing a question. What's really neat is actually Mark uh, in chapter 9 also records this story. But we find a lot more 
of the details that are involved. This was happening again, you know, at that same time the disciples came to Jesus saying this. Well, that was the time they're coming into Capernaum. They're there. They're in the house. And it records that the disciples were actually arguing with each other this. Not just asking the question, but they are confronting one another, are kind of a, I, I think I'm greater, don't you? I, I should be greater. I mean, I was at the transfiguration and you weren't, so I guess I'm greater, right? Or maybe, or I'm, I'm taller, I'm older, I'm whatever. They, they, they are basically trying to answer it amongst themselves, who would be the greatest? Because the kingdom of heaven, they can tell it's underway. They've been hanging out with Jesus, and he's talking about this kingdom of heaven, and they're all of a sudden starting to see it come about, and, be and they're like, okay, where's my seat in this? And they start asking Jesus about it. Well, I think it would be really important for us to define the kingdom of heaven, this very thing they're asking about. So from, because uh, we've been going through Matthew, actually this is pulled from an earlier message of going through Matthew, because Matthew, the gospel of Matthew actually speaks a lot of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, Jesus is talking and teaching on this. So here is the de definition of the kingdom of heaven, that it is the domain ruled by God as the sovereign king. It is a domain marked by love, purpose, order, goodness, joy, peace, and holiness. That's this thing they're talking about. And what's really neat is the nature of the kingdom of heaven. Because Jesus announcing it is saying, it's here. I'm bringing it now. The kingdom of heaven is here and yet is coming. It's a really unique thing because it has its it's initiated, you're able to be a part of it, yet it has this fulfillment level that's still on the horizon that we're looking forward to. It's a really amazing thing, and his disciples are getting excited about it, obviously. However, it's a real personal ego level of excitement they're gaining because they bring the question, so when this is all going on, who's got the special seat? Well, Jesus answers their question. Verse 2, and calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them. So he brings a child, puts the child in the midst of his disciples. They're together, they're having this conversation, asking this question, and he puts a little kid in the middle of them. Mark also gives us some details about this kid, it's saying that Jesus actually picked him up and, and set him there. I mean, this is, we're talking toddler, like little guy, okay? This isn't like a 12-year-old that he's like, hey, stop playing your games and come over here. I, I'm using you for an illustration. I mean, he, he's got a little guy that is there in the middle of this group and saying, all right, look at this, and says in verse 3, truly... I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So their question is, who's the greatest? His initial answer is, are you even there? Hold on. <laughs> Back it up a little bit. Brings in the kid as the example and is saying, uh, truly, I say to you. And it should be noted that this is kind of a Jesus distinctive. That he is now saying, truly I say to you. This is actually a line that he uses. That word is amen. Which is commonly done at the end of a prayer. And it has this meaning of so be it. Let it be so. I have prayed this and I'm believing in faith. Let it, let it be. Yet, when Jesus leads a thought with this truly I say to you. He's leading with the amen, which literally means this is absolutely true and absolutely important. Turn your ears on. <laughs> 
This is also how he led out when he had his Sermon on the Mount, which I'm sure we're getting a lot of mixed, you know, verbiage with this. And he's like, okay, guys, remember that? Same deal. Truly, I say to you. So turn on the ears. This is a big deal. And he (laughs) says, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So you have asked the wrong question. You have not asked, you shouldn't be asking who is the greatest. Uh, should I, am I there? Well, he gives the steps for becoming there. It is actually turning and becoming like a child. That is what is required for entrance to the kingdom of heaven. That actually uh, leads us to our first point. Be sure you are in God's family. That's a big deal. Because they're coming and saying, hey, what's, what's my status? Uh, what, what, is the, what is my role going to look like in this thing? I'm excited. And he's bringing the question of make sure you're part of this family before you start finding your role, your thing. Your, like, let's back it up a level. And the process to becoming that actually is turning and becoming like a child. Not telling him to think like a juvenile or to like act in a childish manner. This little one that he's using as an example for them is utterly dependent. This is a little child that without their parent is not okay. Truly not okay. And that is their security and all the things they need. And he's saying... That is exactly the way you need to address your Father in heaven. I can't do this on my own. I actually need God. That's what he's saying. To become part of the family is truly this example of childlike faith. Of saying, I I accept this message. I want to turn and become like a child. I want for not my will to be done here and my greatness or my esteem, but I want to just make sure that I am received. And by do, turning away from your own ego, basically that happens by you saying, Lord, let your will be done in my life. I believe you. I accept you. I am, de- I am absolutely dependent upon you. For everything that matters, I'm absolutely dependent. He's saying that's it. When you turn that way, that's when you get it. That's when all of a sudden we're in the kingdom. You're part of God's family. To turn and become like a child is required for entrance to the kingdom of heaven. We're no longer in the self-reliant status, but we're actually in total dependence to God should be noted, he's talking to his disciples. This message he is giving to those who are following him. His disciples, he's saying, all right, guys, let's, let's back it up. <laughs> 101, turn and become like children, accepting this. And then that's going to bring us to the answer of his, their question. So when you understand the first part, you can get the second. Verse 4, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So you want to know how to be the greatest? No problem. Humble yourself. You want to be the top? Well, become the bottom. You want to have the most Focus, prestige will get rid of whatever you have now. Like you, we're, even Jesus demonstrates this, where when he says, I, I, uh, "Hello, I didn't come to be served, but I came to serve and give my life as a ransom." Like not, I didn't come here to be elevated, to be focused. To, like no, be humble. Like absolutely humble. That's the key. But guess what's really cool? Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever is a very inclusive word. It actually means whoever. You, me, whoever. You humble yourself, there you go. 
That's how you start earning this greatness in the kingdom of heaven. Which almost makes you reconsider, okay, what, what does it mean to be great in the kingdom? <laughs> because I'm going to choose to humble myself and live this life of humility. And that's what starts making the difference. He really needed his followers and you and I to get that. And so he's being very clear, like, yes, turn and become a follower. Turn and be dependent. But at the same time, humble yourself. And he's using the child as the example, but at this point, I mean, he's basically saying, guys, this, this really is significant on the own, your own boosting of yourself can really get in the way of your usefulness to the kingdom. <laughs> Be super careful. There's some verses um, I'd love for you to be able to see. Romans chapter 12, verse 3. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, everyone, again, kind of an everyone among you, to not think of himself more highly than he ought to think. If you think you are the bee's knees, you're not. So just let it go. Don't think of yourself higher than you are, or more important than you are, or more significant than you are, because Scripture is saying, all right, don't think of yourself as this, wow, what on earth would the world do without you? Guess what? What are you doing to help those around you? Let's continue it on. But to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. I've got really good news. God has a really important role for you. Super important. But he's chosen it. And that's what we're trying to let you step into. I'm going to humble myself like a child and say, Lord, let your will be done in my life. The way I express myself, the way I communicate, the way my gifts are even used, let them be according to your plan and your will you are in the driver's seat, and I'm lucky to be in the car. <laughs> really, that's where we are at. And so that's what he's trying to let them know, guys. This really matters. And it begins to Im significantly impact the others around you when you become more humble. Listen to this. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. Clothe yourself. All love you with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I want to receive grace from God. I know you do too. <laughs> and it's saying, hey, if we are actually going to humble ourselves, that's where it comes. We're going to set these things aside, we're going to humble ourselves. And it's going to have a dramatic impact into the family of God. And we're going to continue to talk about that if you want to come on up here. So let's get ready. I do want to come up here. Yeah. So first, don't make any assumptions. Make sure you're in the family. Right? Make sure you're a part of the family. And then as we get into verses 5 through 10, what we're going to see is that we need to then... In this humble state, welcome the rest of God's family, right, as our own. This is one of the, this is one of the, um, it's, it's a glorious truth, it's a glorious reality that in everyday life, I think we forget it over, or, or to at least a degree, overlook it. And, and, that, is, and that is this, that, um, I'll say it like this, if by faith, in the Lord Jesus Christ, I am a member of God's family. And if by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a member of God's family, then that makes us family, right? We, we, we don't share bloodlines, heritage, lineage, but because of the work that God is doing in growing his family, when we believe in Christ, we become his children. And as his children, that makes us brothers and sisters in the Lord. 
And that is a glorious truth, but we, we sometimes forget that. And so when we, get to, when we get to this Matthew 18, we see how important it is for Jesus. Remember, we go back to chapter 16 where Jesus has asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And there was these various thoughts. And then Peter gets this revelation from God, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And, and then Jesus says, that is correct based on that truth, the fact of who I am, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. And so this is, this is similar language that God is growing his family. God is building his family. And that, that the fact that we believe in Jesus and belong to Jesus, that makes us family. And so, and so it's a truth that we need to embrace. And, and in our minds, again, in this humble state, we've turned and we want to become like little children. And, and that makes us a part of the family of God. And then in this humble state, we want to welcome the rest of the family like our own family. Love, care, all of those things. And verses 5 through 10 are, uh, are telling us how to go about that, at least in part. And verse 5 is a positive statement, saying here's what you need to do. And verses 6 through 10 are statements that are very heavy, as we've read, and we'll see those, but it's basically saying, here's how to not mess up verse 5, okay? So, so to verse 5, Jesus says this, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. So we want to welcome one another. So I say it like this, do welcome one another like you would Jesus. The rest of our statements are don'ts. So there's one thing that we need to do, welcome one another as if we would welcome Jesus himself. And the rest of them, don't do these things. Otherwise, you're not welcoming Jesus the way others like you would welcome Jesus. So when he says, receive one such child in my name, whoever does that receives me. And and to receive somebody in this manner is like how you would receive a guest into your home. And, so, and I've qual- let's qualify it, a desired guest, somebody that you actually want in your house. So if, so if you, somebody knocks on your door, you don't know who it is, and you come to the door, and it's a friend you haven't seen forever, you're like, oh, wow, come in, let's get caught up, this is awesome. And in another scene, there's a knock on your door, and you open it up, and it's somebody with a little badge that announces that they're an IRS agent. Your response isn't likely the same right? Your response is more like, um, if I have to let you in my house, I will, but I'm not welcoming you, really. This is not quite the same. And, and so when we, uh, let, me, let me just ask you, let's just think for just a moment. And it isn't about like simply about having somebody in your house, but in your life, in the way that you're living out your Christian life, um, are you receiving people the way Jesus says here in verse 5. Do, to receive, to, to open your life up, to give somebody access to your life, to welcome them. Is that your basic nature? Is that, is that, the, is that the, um, the environment that you create with your, with your faith? That, that people are, that, that you receive them, that you welcome them? Or is, it, or is it more of a kind of it's you and Jesus and you're trying to live out your faith, and you really don't have much regard for the rest of the family of God. Because there's a, there are versions of, of that that are not biblical versions, but there are versions of, of that that, that, we, that we see in our, in our American culture where there's a very individualistic, and so it's like me and Jesus and nobody else because I just, I, I just don't necessarily want to be a part of all of that. Well, it's a misunderstanding of what it means to be in the family of God then, right? So, so Jesus says, whoever receives one such child. Now, there is also a, there's kind of two sides to this. There's the, there's the actual real practical side to this, and then there's this other side where Jesus makes a subtle shift that we need to catch. So on the actual side of it, let's go, okay, there's a child standing in the midst of all of these disciples, and Jesus refers to this child, turn and become like this child. Admit your humble dependence, your complete dependence upon God, and, uh, and that's how, that, then you'll know you're in the kingdom, right? You're a part of the kingdom. And, um, and so to receive one such child, we could say practically, well, that would be like, opening my life up and, um, and welcoming children 
right? We get that. that. That's a good thing. That's a real practical thing. So I think about the, there's a, a small army of people who serve uh, throughout City Point Church, whether in the nursery or in, um, in kids' ministry, like elementary age. Um, we have our Awana program uh, and then our student ministries, right? Kids and teens. And we say we got to seek the young. That's one of our values. And so we go all out for kids and teens. And so there's a whole bunch of people who are doing, in the very practical sense, what verse 5 says, right? Receive uh, receive a child. And, and in doing so, you're receiving Christ. So you're opening your life up. You're welcoming kids into your life. You're investing in them. And, um, and that's a real practical way. And, uh, and we're going to continue to develop out our, um, our family life ministry. And as we do that, there's always room for others to invest in the lives of kids. In fact, our next step, um, we made the announcement with Cassie last week, our next step in, in our family life ministry is we want to take... Um, we want to create an, uh, a specialized class for kindergartners and first graders because right now the kindergartners are m- with the toddlers and the first graders are with like the fourth and fifth graders. And if you know anything about early childhood development, you know that there's a miss there, right? The, the kindergartners are beyond the toddlers. The first graders are not where the fourth and fifth graders are. So we want to create a class that is specific to kindergartners and first graders. And in fact, on your connection card, there's a spot where you could, uh, here's what I would say. I, I, we need a dozen people to commit to a schedule to say, I want to serve in that area like once a month. That would be awesome. If we had a dozen people, we could move forward with that like as soon as possible. That would be really sweet. So think about that. This is a practical way to, um, to welcome the rest of God's family as your own, welcoming people into your life like you would Jesus and specifically the children. But here's the subtle shift, right? Here's, the, here's this subtle shift. So when Jesus says, whoever receives one such child in my name, the question is, is he referring to the actual little kid or is he referring to those who have turned and become like children? And the, the shift is that he's actually now referring to those who have turned and become like children. So it isn't about being kind to children only. Of course, they're included in that, but it's about the entire family of God, young and old, because nobody's a part of the family of God unless they've turned and become like little children. And whoever receives any of these one such little ones in Jesus' name receives Jesus. So we welcome others like we would welcome Jesus. That's pretty cool, right? So we we know that because when we get into the next verse, verse 6, Jesus tells us to not hinder others in their faith. That's number two. Don't hinder others in their faith. And and, and look at how it reads. And a part of it's really heavy, right? But whoever causes, that's that word scandalizo, right? Whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, so the little ones here, is not just the little kid. The little one is, is anybody who's a follower of Jesus. They've turned and become like a child. Now, we're either teens or adults in here. There, or there's a few little kids, little babies and such. But most of us as teens or adults, it, it doesn't feel like a compliment to be called a little one. Like, especially like I'm thinking of the grown men. If you come up to me and say, oh, Brent, you're, you're just such a good little one. That would not feel like a compliment to me. I'd be like, get away from me. You're weird, <laughs> right? But, that, but, but in, the, in the spirit of this text, we, we could even go back to Matthew 10, 42, where Jesus actually identifies his disciples as just that, little ones. So between the two of us, I'm going to respect you as a grown man or a grown woman or as a teenager, a young adult, whatever. I'm going to, we'll, we'll respect each other in that way. But when it comes to God, we're all little ones. We're little ones. And so when Jesus says that whoever, uh, that, that whoever causes one of these little ones, he's not just talking about children. He's talking about anybody who's a follower of Christ. Remember last week, don't offend those who, that you want to bring the gospel to. Don't trip them up. Because you need to get the gospel to them. But now this week, don't offend or don't cause to sin those who are already in the family because you're supposed to, you're supposed to live the gospel with those people. So we got to be careful how we treat one another in our actual actions, our words, our attitudes, all of that. Don't hinder others in their faith. And here's, like, there's p- parts of me, you all know, if you've been a part of City Point Church for a while, you all know that we don't shy away from any 
passage of Scripture. We try to deal with it, handle it, no matter how hard it is. It's just like, this is it, friends. This is the Bible, and my job is to say what's been said. There are parts of me, there's that kind of sinful, selfish part of me that wants to lessen the blow here, that wants to say, this this is a little bit different, right? But Jesus says this, and the last thing I want to do is change what Jesus said. But it's, it's, it's tough, isn't it? Whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. It would be better. Death by drowning would be better than what the person's going to face who hinders followers of Christ from following Christ. That's pretty serious, isn't it? You glad the air's on right now? Because it's kind of hot in here. <laughs> That's a tough statement. But you get the sense, we get the sense that Jesus is pretty serious. Don't mess with his family. If you're in the family, don't mess with his family. He's not kidding. So in a kind of a big scale, we could think about, we could think about those, those teachers or those professors, like in a university setting, who take it upon themselves to try and get those young adults and those students who are coming into their class, they set about to mess with their faith so that they would abandon their faith. Like they're purposely trying to, uh, to, to, uh, to give argumentation that a, a student is not yet able to answer, and so it gets them to doubt, gets her to, 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 to the idea is to get them to walk away from their faith. You know, you know those teachers and those professors? It would be better for them to drown to death than to face the reckoning that they're going to face. That's a fearful thing, right? There's something super sobering about that. But then think about, uh, okay, so that's a big grand scale, but think about it on a, like, for, for, like for us. Like if we're legitimate followers of Christ, we've turned and we've, and we've become like little children and we've humbled ourselves and we don't know where our status is in the kingdom of God. We're not worried about being great in the kingdom. We just want to serve in the kingdom. We just want to be a part of the kingdom and play our part. Like Brandon said, we've got an important part. And so we're not jockeying for position. We've got our heads on our shoulders straight in that regard. But what if, what if, by our lack of engagement, other people are watching our lives. And what if by our lack of engagement, we hinder them because we're not, we're, we haven't opened our lives up. We haven't welcomed and opened our lives up to other people. And so, and so they look at us and they go, well, they're a Christian, but we don't see them involved. We're, they're a Christian, but we don't see them engaged, et cetera, et cetera. And so is it possible that on a lesser degree, they could, people could, we could be hindering people, not even purposely, but because, we are, because we're not fully engaged in what Jesus has said we should be engaged in, that we're hindering people? That's something to consider, right? And we certainly wouldn't want that. We don't want to hinder others in their faith. And we get to verse 7, we get this sense. Don't be a source of temptation for others. There's a woe issued here, which is really a statement of horror. Woe to the world, Jesus says. Woe to the world. This, the New Living Translation translates that. What sorrow awaits? What sorrow awaits those um, for the world, what sorrow awaits the world for temptations to sin? That's that Greek word. This is the noun ver- form of it, scandalon. For it is necessary, the word necessary there, we would probably think of it more like um, something that is um, like it's, uh, it's, it's, it's bound to happen. It's necessary. It's bound to happen that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom they come. So in this broken world, we, we know sin's a part of this broken world, but we don't want to be the cause. We don't want to be the source of temptation for others. So though it's inevitable, it doesn't have to come through us. And Jesus says, it better not. If you're part of the family, you've got to welcome the family as your own family. And, and none of us would want to be a source of temptation for others in our family. So, so again, consider the severity of the judgment here that Jesus is talking about. Woe to the world for temptations to come. And, and so you think about, I mean, again, grand scale. Think about, think about in this world the the woe that people in a drug cartel 
Like, let's go big scale. Like, if you're in a drug cartel, there's a woe. There's a woe coming for you. You're getting massive amounts of people hooked on drugs and wrecking their lives and wrecking their families. There's a woe coming for you. It, that's, it's horrible, right? Think about people who produce pornography or who promote racism or who run gambling industries. All of these things just wrecking lives, right? Whoa. What sorrow awaits people who are doing those things, right? But, but then again, let's, let's, we want to scale it from the grand scale down to maybe we're not in a drug cartel. <laughs> if you are, whoa, turn and become like a little child. Otherwise, you're going to face a day of reckoning that you have never measured, right? But, it, but, but maybe we're not that. But, but maybe because, because we're living our lives in front of others and they see us, even if we're trying to hide it, the reality is it's there. So if, so if we're self-indulgent or if we're materialistic or, or, or we use coarse or foul language, all of those things affect other people, right? It's not just like our thing. It, it affects other people. If we make fun of others and we gossip and we badmouth and, and if we're overindulgent with food or with alcohol, I mean, the list could be extensive, friends. If we have fits of anger rather than self-control and refraining from anger, if we're lazy or if we're lustful, the reality is it's not done on an island and nobody else sees it. Even if we think nobody else sees it, it affects us and it affects them. And so we don't want to be a source of temptation for others. Jesus offers a woe here. And and that works right into verses 8 and 9, which are in magnitude, they're like huge, right? Where, Where he says... To his disciples, do not let sin rule in your own life. Do not let sin rule in your own life. He says, if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, again, there's that word, scandalizo. It's a scandal to allow sin to rule in your life. If it, if it is, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than, to, than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. If we've been a part of this series, we know Jesus used some of that exact same language in the Sermon on the Mount. But here, he ties it not just to our personal responsibility, but to our responsibility to the rest of his family. So the, the, the reality is that, that we have to be attentive to ourselves for the sake of others. Because anything that is tripping us up will eventually trip somebody else up. And it's, it's, not, just, it's not just me and Jesus and my walk with Jesus. It's a collective effort. It's a community effort in the body of Christ. And so we have a responsibility one with another. And so Jesus uses this super strong language it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, uh, what they call hyperbole, right? It, it, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a form of um, exaggeration. It's literary, uh, it's a literary tactic here where you, where you exaggerate your point for the sake of making it really clear. And it, again, it's Jesus. He's not teaching self mutilation. He's not saying you pluck your eyes out, cut your hands off. Not literally. He's, he's saying you have to do whatever necessary to make sure that sin doesn't rule in your life, it's that important. No, no matter how, you have to limit yourself. You have to, if you've got to box yourself in, if you've got to cut yourself off from this person or that person or this relationship or that, whatever it is, whatever's causing you to sin, cut it off. Because life is better than, eternal life is better than eternal death. Right? And, it, and it is really, it is really tough because because Jesus mentions the hell of fire here. He mentions the eternal fire and the hell of fire. He puts that forth as motivation to not allow sin to rule in our lives. And, and, and according to Jesus and the rest of the Bible, it's, hell is a re- real, it's an actual, real, literal, terrible, and eternal place. And so we're not to allow sin to rule in our lives. Turn, become like little children, humble yourselves, and don't let sin rule in your life because it's destructive 
And not only will it destroy you, it'll destroy others. Right. So cut it off. Don't allow it. Take whatever measures necessary. Actually, if, for those of you that listen to our Inside Out podcast, we're going to talk about that concept next week, this coming week. The, the eternal fire, the hell of fire. It's an interesting concept. Right? And, and then, lastly, he kind of brings the whole scene home or he kind of wraps it up in verse 10 and says, don't nurse a bad attitude toward your fellow believers. So, so again, we go back to, so go, go to verse 10. See, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. There's that phrase again. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. Again, um, none of us like to think of ourselves as little ones, but he's referring to, he's talking to his little ones, his disciples, and he's saying to them, don't despise one of these little ones. And they start looking at each other. Remember the context. They've been arguing with each other about who's the greatest. Likely, if I'm claiming to be the greatest in the group, it's I'm looking down. That's what it means to despise here. It's to look down on somebody else. So if I think I'm the greatest, I'm looking down on you, and I don't think you're the greatest. And now Jesus says, you guys are, you guys are out of line, right? You, in the family of God, you don't get to look down on one another. Don't despise one another. Do not allow your heart to nurse an attitude toward others in the body of Christ. And what, here's something crazy. We're going to talk about this on the podcast as well next week. Here's something crazy. What's his reasoning? Because in heaven, their angels, the angels of these little ones, always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What does that mean? That's the reason we're not supposed to mistreat each other. That's, the re- that's one of the reasons we're not supposed to look down on one another because each one of us, if we're one of the little ones, we have angels who are in heaven who are looking into the face of God. Wh- what? Isn't that something? You never thought of that before, did you? When I'm tempted to look down on a fellow believer for whatever reason, I'm supposed to remember there are angels who are looking at the face of God. <laughs> it seems almost, it's a little different, isn't it? What do you do with that? Yeah, we'll talk about that next week, but, uh, this coming week in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the podcast. But the point can't be missed. We've got to be real careful with how we treat one another. We've got to be real careful in not allowing hindrance, not to trip others up that we're supposed to be living the gospel with. Right? And, and, and again, we get the sense that Jesus is very serious about this. And so, um, we should be too, right? So I've asked Brandon if he would just come back and, and wrap this up. Did a great job in that first part. Thank you for that, Brandon. So let's, let, br- let's bring this home, would you? Wrap, yeah. wrap this up for us. Okay. God bless. <laughs> so it's a pretty weighty <laughs> portion of Scripture here. But there's some really good things, and there's some really intentional things, and, and Jesus said it, so it matters, and we're plugging it in. The big idea out of this, what we've been talking through here, is that living well within God's family is a must for God's family. Being in the family is important, and once you're there, you got a role, and really it's to live well with one another. That's a big deal. And so that's what that, well, and how does, what does that look like? As we build a little bit of application and some ways to respond to this, we're hearing some big things, but I mean, obviously, have you turned and become like a child and accepted the kingdom of heaven? Are you in? That's a big question. And it's one that is easily answered. Well, are you depending on God? Is that where your hope is? Is that where your salvation is? Is that, have you confessed (laughs) your need for a Savior? That's the application. Starting out there. And so I would say if if you're in a spot where you've just been assuming, maybe thinking, well, I, I go to church and I, I don't, beat people up at random. I guess I'm good, right? It's, but I mean, that's, that's not the idea. Are you in the family? Have you accepted 
that it isn't about something you can just do or strong arm yourself into or force it to happen, but that it's actually a dependence of saying, I give you my life. I can't do it without you. I need your grace. That's, if, if you haven't done that, that would be the best move <laughs> to take in hearing this. You're being fully welcomed into the family. And it's a pretty simple way to get there. So be, if that's where you're at, we would love to connect with you and pray with you in regard to that. The other side of that is, uh, for those that are in the family of God, how are you treating your family members? Are you encouraging? Are you welcoming? When you see folks that are fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, is there a spot to say, you know what, I, I welcome you into my life. I want to be a part of what you're doing, and I want uh, you know, for me to be a part of you. Are maybe, maybe it's as simple as helping out in this early childhood class or seeing someone that has some needs and you can meet those. Inviting, I think we're going to be talking about connection dinners coming up and you could be involved in those. Connecting and sharing life with one another. Being an encouragement to them. Are you an encouragement or a hindrance? That was laid out here too. How do you treat others' faith? Are you weighing theirs against yours, or are you just encouraging theirs and hoping they're encouraging yours back? Well, that would be something to take into play here. Is there something causing you to sin? Because according to Jesus, it'd be better that whatever that is, cut it off and throw it away. Whatever that may, may look like, whatever that is. If it is a boyfriend or girlfriend that is causing you to sin, well, it's time to break up. Sorry. Brokenhearted. Well, you save life. <laughs> is it maybe a hobby that you have that's causing you to sin? Well, find a new hobby. Is it what you pay attention to? What you're focused on? What you spend your free time doing? Is that where the sin is creeping at the door for you, well, guess what? That's got to go. Sorry, it's got to go. For not only just your own good, but then what you're bringing to the family. It really matters. It's significant. And, I mean, we, we have to do that. There isn't a pass on this. And I'm not sorry, because Jesus wasn't really sorry. <laughs> he didn't say, well... I know it's hard news, guys, but you, good luck. That's not it. He's saying, I know, no, he's with us every step of the way, but he's saying you got to do your part. Purge that thing out. Get rid of it. That relationship, that, that focus, that concentration that's causing you to sin, it's got to go. Please. Or maybe you've been looking down. Maybe you're in that spot where... <sighs> You're looking down on other folks, other believers. I'm like, wow, well, I'm glad I'm not as messed up as they are. I'm something else. No, you're not. Sorry. Neither am I. <laughs> nor am I going, uh, nor do I want to <laughs> claim that I am. And so that's where you, we should be, is being able to say, you know what? I don't want to look down on someone else. I, I don't want them to look at, I, I want to accept my sp position. I've turned and become, I'm a follower of Jesus, and I want to respect and love and show that towards all the other family members. That's, I mean, we got a lot to pull away from this, and I know we're landing in this camp on this, some of these things, for sure. So let's, let's pray together on this, Okay. Father God, uh, right now there, there are folks that have been maybe even assuming their spot in the kingdom and we, your family. And we pray right now, Jesus, that you would just be softening hearts, childlike spirits today. Oh, folks, just depending on you, giving you their lives.
sacrificing all their own ambitions and dreams and, and the own identity and selfness that they have to the, who they are and just saying, Lord, I want to be yours. We're praying for that to be the case. Father, for those of us that are in a spot where, where we are tripping up others <laughs> in their faith, we are a stumbling block to other people. Lord, let us stop that immediately. Give us the strength to see that occurring and also to eliminate it. Lord, whatever sin is in our life, we just pray, purge it out. Whatever it may be, as hard as it may be, as major as it may feel, let it be so. We want to serve you. We want to love you. And we do not want to be ruled by sin. You died so that we don't have to. And we accept that. Oh, Father, we just pray that regardless of where we see ourselves in your story, in your kingdom, that we would realize that, Lord, you are writing our spot in. Help us see that and treat others accordingly. Thank you for the family of God. Thank you that we are a part of it and we have been invited to it. Let us live it out the way that you've dreamed it up so that we can truly fulfill the call you've placed on our lives. Thank you for it. In your powerful name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.